Hello, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Engaging Ideas. Today, we'll be talking with Vilika Van Rijn about leadership and digital transformation in the social sector. I'd like to thank you all for joining us. And please don't forget to subscribe or leave us a review after the episode. And now on to the show. Uh, I'm joined today by Vilika Van Rijn coming to me from Scotland. This is exciting. I think this is my first uh, international interview. So I'm very uh, pumped up right now. Um, she's currently serving as the CEO of the Resource Alliance, and their mission statement is the Resource Alliance's mission is to change the world by weaving together a global alliance of people fighting for positive change and equipping them with the knowledge and resources they need to accelerate lasting social impact. Welcome to the show. Thanks very much, Don. Very nice to be here. All right. Well, let us dive in. Uh, so we had a wonderful conversation a few weeks ago, and we talked about many things. Uh, it was awesome mm -hmm. getting to meet you for that first time. Uh, but one of the things we talked about, you have an upcoming IFC conference, and we talked about your theme for the conference, which is Unite. But I'm hoping you could tell our audience who might not be familiar with the conference or you know what's going to go on there, a little bit about the conference, and then also how you came to choose Unite as the theme for the conference this year. Yeah, thanks very much. So the IFC stands for the International Fundraising Congress, and it is held in the Netherlands um, from the 18th till 20th of October this year. And it will be our 41st conference that we are holding. So wow. it has quite a history, um, and it brings the world of fundraising change makers in the social impact sector together. Um, if you ask people about what is it all about, I think conference is not the right word. It's more seen as a three-day festival where people link, share, connect with each other, really around the topic of fundraising, resource mobilization, campaigning, social mm -hmm. movement building, uh, and learn from each other and also start collaborating with each other to create a better, better impact. Where last year after COVID, we finally came back and our theme was around shaping the future together the together element was more important than ever. So this year, our theme will be Unite. And what we mean with Unite is Unite you can do in different ways. One element is around the focus of Unite within your organization. You know, we have um, many organizations where we hear conversations about silos. We have a communications department, a fundraising department, and campaigning departments, and they all work in silos and are not really connecting with each other or the program department is seen separately as the public engagement uh, area. So that uniting is really crucial, especially when you're talking about creating impact. And that's in the end what we're all here for to do. Um, it's also about unite linked in the sector. You know, there are tremendous amount of organizations working around climate change. There are a lot of organizations working about ending poverty. What is a very clear one organization on its own will not achieve that big mission, you know, to really tackle the climate change or to end poverty. So there, there is a definitely um, a look at how can we create collaborations and therefore a bigger impact uh, to achieve together. And how can we learn there from each other and work with each other to establish that. And then last but not least, um, and that's why partly we talk about the social impact uh, sector and not necessarily about civil society organizations alone anymore or nonprofit organizations alone anymore. We see a lot of impact happening from other parts of the world. You know, social movements have been created by individuals. Think about the Me Too movement, Black Lives Matter, think Greta, you know, who initiated a whole movement around uh, tackling the climate uh, climate change. Those are examples about other people that are involved that are not necessarily linked to a nonprofit organization anymore. Uh, but also, you know, we look a lot at social enterprises at the moment, the B Corps that are stepping up and really expanding very fast and where a lot of opportunities are there. So really we want to build on their expertise, their knowledge and see uh, how nonprofit organizations can really work with them uh, to create that reach, to create that voice that is so much needed and to create a change and impact that we want to establish. So yes, it's unite on many different levels. It's all about bringing people and ideas together and making it happen. I love it. I love how it layers really well too, you know, mm. from the inside the whole way to the, the global perspective. Um, I'm curious for two quick follow-ups for anyone who is listening. Is there... Um... From this, do you put reports out? You know, if you're watching the B Corps and then you're sort of funneling it down, is there 
like a learning management system or something or some way people can get to your reports or the knowledge and everything you're gaining and how do you share once the conference ends how do you yeah once the, well once the conference ends we definitely share our content to as wide an audience as possible and in one way we started doing that by providing the conference not only in person anymore but in hybrid versions so that means that online a lot of people really can join. And besides that, we really work with um, what we call our virtual content library, where we really want to give access to that knowledge and expertise to as many people as possible. I think it's partly about disseminating that content and what we sometimes call the democratization of knowledge so that everyone can really build on it. It's crucial, I think, when we're looking at civil society organizations or social impact in a broader sense, that we start learning from each other and not reinventing the wheel. The wheel has been invented already and we really, really can build on each other and with each other. And the beautiful thing, I think, when we're talking about social impact is that that's what we want to do, because in the end, that's what's needed to create that impact. Oh, my heart's jumping with joy. Yes, a uh, thousand percent agreeing with everything you're saying right now. Yes, the wheel has been invented. How do we keep moving forward? And it's interesting. Uh, the silos within orgs, we see that all the time. And I I always think of where does that come from? Where's the transformation? And I've, I wrote once about it. I think it was starting in HR and finance where you have this annual goal and then you have your individual HR performance goals and budget for that year. And I have mine and the two aren't really linking. Yeah. So like, how do we get the whole org thinking about it? But in, in your second about the sector, which is interesting, I wrote down the word co-opetition, which I heard a lot. As I was growing growing up over the last 23 years in the nonprofit sector, uh, where they were, we're working on the same issue, but then we're still competing for the same funds at some yeah. point. And you know, I know it's a theme that you want to get into this year, but do you have any thoughts on that? Like how how do we actually start to get to that collaborative place where you don't feel you're com necessarily competing? You really could cooperate. Yeah, personally, I have to say I absolutely cannot stand the word competition when we're talking about social impact sector. Uh, mm -hmm. I think as soon as we start talking about competition, we probably have lost the plot. It's yeah, a statement, I know, but <laughs> no, I really think I love we it. have lost the plot because in the end, you know, and, and it's interesting what you're saying about your personal, what are your personal targets? What is, for example, the target of a fundraising area? And often that is mentioned in an income target. But that's not necessarily why we are there working in the social impact sector. You know, it is not to achieve those 10 million or plus 100,000 uh, income this year. It is really to create that impact and the driven purpose for what we are there. So it's crucial to keep that cost, the cost that we are working for in mind. And if that is not our starting point, then we get into elements of competition, you know. Who is sending out a message to our supporters? Is it the campaign area? Is it the fundraising area? Is it the communications area? But if we start seeing it towards what kind of purpose are we really working upon and how can we really make that um, and establish that in the best way possible, um, then your 10 million or plus 100,000 becomes a complete different, different story. And you really start looking at other elements that are crucial there as well. And maybe to add to that, I think that is also really looking at the role of supporter in a different way. So as a fundraising department, if you see your supporter as a donor and that's what a supporter does, you know, it, the, the person gives you a financial donation and nothing else. I feel sometimes that is really kind of narrow minded because that supporter perhaps also wants to raise her or his voice. The person also maybe want to allocate some time towards the cause. And we really noticed that the more a person is involved in the cause and in the work that is happening, you know, the more loyal the person will be towards all other elements as well. And you see often a combination there of doing different things. It is not saying pushing everyone to do everything at once, but definitely giving people the opportunity to do so is really crucial. And I think if we start seeing people as human beings and when they are asked, uh, often actually we still receive a yes towards initiatives uh, to be part of a course that's really yeah a beautiful a beautiful aspect where we want to be yeah i mean we we talk a lot about it I and mean, we even came up with a model over the years we call engagement architecture because for me it was it was never about pure attention or one interaction it was you know i was talking to a person a couple of weeks ago up in philadelphia and he's working in fundraising and he was trying to change the mindset from the 
donation given at a single point in time to a lifetime value of engagement with the organization. Mm -hmm. and he, you know, he did this data and he found like 40% of their current, I don't know, big donors uh, started out with like a hundred dollar gift, you know, but over yeah. the course of 20 years, they've evolved and then they're really committed. And now they're, they're putting a lot more towards it. And I, I'm with you. I think there's an, there's an undervalue in what we can do over time when people start to feel aligned with us. And it, as you're talking, my head was just going to between the, the internal at the org, between the sector and between the, the mm -hmm. stakeholders, it's like, how do we all share the mission? You know, so we all feel a part of it and then we can all have a yeah. part to push it forward rather than I'm just doing this piece and I got to own this and don't, don't tell me what I'm supposed to do. Like, how do I take more feedback in and how do we, how do you do it on those levels? It's kind of where my head was going when you were talking. Yeah, we had some beautiful examples of that recently. So we had a big um, uh, online conference about digital fundraising, but we also looked there at, in a way, like movement building and a constituency building around mm -hmm. certain causes. And there was an organization in India, it's called the Internet Freedom Foundation, that is fighting for freedom rights in India um, and the freedom of speech around, in, uh, around internet related topics. Uh, and they are quite a legal organization. It's um, not the easiest of topics to raise funds for, but they really built a constituency, um, a constituency where they involve their supporters explaining why there is a need for this. Um, they are really organizing those kind of monthly webinars to explaining about the projects that they are doing, the successes that are happening, but also how the constituency and the, the supporter base can support them or what initiatives they can take to do more than only their financial support. Uh, and they really see a beautiful loyal group there helping them and that is supporting them in their work as well by saying this is not only what we as an organization want but we have a whole constituency behind us that is supporting us in the work that we are doing which of course was a beautiful example to see that correlation between financial support towards the cause but also doing additional things to yeah to make that happen and see it almost as an integrated group of people not necessarily office and the organization staff versus supported, it really became a unity. Yeah. And that brings us, by the way, back to Unite, which is nice. Yeah. <laughs> right. It's so powerful what you just said, right? The in, We're integrated in this. Like, I've given my money. I'm integrated into your cause. Don't act like I just did this one thing and I'm not around anymore. Like, yeah. I've, I care about it a lot, too, because I took this after-tax dollar and handed it to you to try to make a difference. Just curious too, I might, I might bounce around like we talked about some of the questions, but you know, I, you've recently just were on a panel discussion um, at Catalyst 2030. And I, I, you and I were just talking about it. And some of this was about the role of, uh, and the change I think within the funding sector too, because as I'm hearing this, I'm like, how do we celebrate all of the wins? Like if I'm working on this cause, I should be celebrating the other group that made a huge success rather than thinking, oh man, they got that. Now they're going to get more funding than I'm going to get. So, you know, what role do the funders have to play in this too, of helping to start to unite all of us and, and push things forward rather than keep us divided? Yeah, we had a beautiful discussion at the Catalyst Week. Catalyst 2030 is a network of social enterprises across the globe, and they organize this week um, and a Catalyst Week where they bring people together to really discuss topics that are happening at the moment. Um, and as Resource Alliance, we combined our efforts with WINGS, a network around foundations, together with Catalyst 2030, to talk about shifting the funding paradigm. And it's very much linked to shift the power. Where should the power lie? What is the role of the funders in it? But what's also the role of the fundraisers, which, of course, we brought in and often the interesting, I think, part of the fundraiser is that it is that connects between the funder and the work in the projects that is happening and the people in the projects that is happening. Uh, and there was a very strong voice around principles that have been developed from the foundation's perspective towards saying, you know, where is the community uh, involved in here? You know, the community where we are, where we are implementing or executing or um, creating projects uh, with, where is their voice? Because they have power and they know what is needed. Um, or if you're talking about climate change related topics or nature related topics, you know, are we really having that focus in mind when we're talking about shifting the power and shifting the funding paradigm? So in a way, I think it's always bringing it back to purpose. 
it's very nice to say, you know, this is what we want to do, or we want to be nicer and trustful and truthful. But if we do not have the right stakeholders in that conversation, and if we do not start at the right point, we are really missing an opportunity there. And in the end, um, we all know, you know, we all have powers in us. Um, and if we need to change certain things or if we need to improve certain things, I think we need to start by asking the people with whom it impacts and who really would love to make a change and transform. So, yeah, I'm a very strong believer of it starts with the communities, with the people in the project involved. And that is the starting point. And for, for us, then it's almost a listening ear in the beginning. And from there, a translation towards what does this mean funding wise? And whom are we going to reach out to? Um, and I think that's a beautiful element that we can play as fundraisers. You know, it is also that that role of almost informing funders. This is what is happening in the field. This is what is happening with the people in the program. You know, with whom we are working with. So you have kind of a translation role there, which is a beautiful, I think, a beautiful perspective as a fundraiser to have those two worlds that you can connect into one. Yeah, my head's going too. We actually just in my company, we're having this interesting conversation of like, if we're selling a product and then we're a service, I should say we don't do products, but, um, and then the team's delivering it. How are we doing the feedback loops Yeah, to make, to make sure everything's working right? And we're tiny, right? So I'm thinking about like, how, how do you do that when it's, if you're the funding organization to the fundraiser, to the work that's happening, to the communities that's happening within you know, I, I, I think, you're, yeah, I mean, how do we start to create this new pathway for people to listen? And just because you have the money at the top, how do we, I mean, and I don't want to sound rude to any uh, philanthropies out there. I don't mean it this way, but how do you not just call the shots because you've got the money? You know, how, how, yes. can, you, how can you get humble uh, and, and yes. take some feedback? Yeah, and I think in the end, I think humble is a beautiful word there. Uh, and I think the other aspect is really keep in mind why we're there for. You know, it's really to create that purpose and that impact. And that really has a starting point. And that is the starting point at where the change and the transformation is happening. So start there with listening to the people. Start there with understanding what is the issue, what are the needs, the real needs, instead of saying we might think this might be help you and often that is a dialogue in two ways you know of course beautiful ideas can come out from other parts of the world and from other other elements as well but then you're really getting into a dialogue and a conversation of how to achieve it in the best way instead of almost a kind of an implementing or um or almost saying this is this this is what we think is best for you i think we should avoid uh, that very strongly yeah the whole paternalistic white savior moment that happened for a uh, long time in the yeah. development world at least uh yeah, absolutely. I mean, I wrote down you know, how do we do it together? Not do it, do it with, not to. Like when we're doing mm. these activities, is what I started thinking about when you said that. Because if we have to reestablish trust within so many communities too over time, and I think it was too often. This is this is the right thing for you, so we're going to do it because we see it. Rather than how do, how do I pull you into the conversation with me? Yeah, and then also you know in conversations, how do those conversations happen? Um, we're often talking about equal partnership, but how do you know that an equal partnership is really established? That I think also that is that is quite quite important. Yeah. So the the listening ear and the humble, I think, definitely uh, resonate there very strongly. So, what role uh, can data play in facilitating change? You know, as we start to think about this, because there's always there's the qualitative, which I think it, it matters very heavily in the type of work we do. But then there is quantitative that we can try to look at you know, to guide or steer a little bit to give us some indicators and direction, but, you know, and then there's also trying to keep that data safe if we're looking at it, but yeah, I don't know, maybe I'm leading too much <laughs> the question here. Yeah, how, no. what, what can data do for us? Well, data give you a lot of insights about what is happening and the results that you want to achieve. Data can give you also some nice niches, elements and or areas in it that are kind of golden nuggets that you want to explore further is there an opportunity you know that you see there that actually might have an, an a broader impact or that we can uh, accelerate upon because it really seemed to work data often gives you kind of the answer on the hypothesis that you might have is it correct is it not correct um, and often by having the facts in hand that makes the position stronger to yeah, create more attention towards or to address 
uh, more focus upon in any kind of form. You know, it could be in in raising voices, in 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 raising funding for it um, to make it happen. I think sometimes we also have to be aware with data is that we are measuring up till now. You know, so is that necessarily the way forward, or do how do we how do we really look at data with what is the next new thing that needs to happen? So I think, yeah, when talking about those niches, they are quite important for me personally, not to, you know, only look at the past, but also what is the direction? So in a way, innovation there is always crucial to explore new things to see if they could improve situations and therefore challenge maybe some data points from now towards new data points in the future. Um, so I think they are they are they are strongly aligned uh, in a way. But yeah, data has definitely given you the facts and um, the stronger voice and arguments um, to to create transformation. Yeah, you could see the pickup. You know, I would I would I was resonating with you there. We often find a lot because we do a lot of work with data too and analysis and helping people come up with reports and look at it and democratizing data. How do we really spread it out across the org? But it is often, to your point, very rear view mirror like what happened in the past and what I've often found, I, I really loved how you put innovation on it, but that what matters. Cause it's like, I could try new things, but if I haven't anchored it in some kind of way to mm -hmm. judge or test what I'm doing, I'm just spinning rather than pivoting. And a pivot is I'm making a clear decision based off of things that I've seen in the past and where I think I need to go heuristically into the future. And I'm going to measure it based on X, Y, and Z. But I feel like without that bit of data that wraps it, you, it's easy to get lost and it's easy to get into the cult of personality. And Tony just thinks this is the way to go. And I'm going to keep doing it, whether I'm driving this thing into the ground or not. Yeah, that rear view comment is really important, I think, for folks to understand. Yeah, and for example, if you're talking about uh, the IFC, the International Fundraising Congress, we we use a lot of research there to to share with the participants and with audiences to really know what is happening where and what is working, what is not working. At the same time, I always like the combination there with sharing the best practice. So how did you really do it? What was the crucial element yeah. to achieve that data? You know, what did you do different compared to former years? And and I think that that combination of data effects combined with the knowledge behind the how it got established yeah. is really crucial for a lot of people to build upon. And many people might say, but I operate in a different culture and that's completely true. I do not argue against that at all. But again, there comes a little bit of point about inventing the wheel or reinventing the wheel. Is this something that you can build upon? You know, does this give you a starting block by saying, oh, so this works there. Maybe it works in our country, in our area, in our circumstances as well. Maybe with a tiny tweak or with a tiny, you know, to, to really make it localized um, yes. in, in your surroundings. But at least you do not have to start from scratch uh, somewhere. So, yeah, I think that exchange across the world and across the globe um, is something that is really beautiful and that everyone can build upon. And that is often a combination of that data combined with the how did the data get established. Yeah. Yeah, I love the idea of, I've talked about this here in the States too, but just an open source knowledge framework, because to your point, it has to be localized, you know, even in the US yeah. where I'm sitting, you know, working on child hunger in New York City is very different than Kansas City. And you could have similar steps to take, but when you actually implement within those two very different metropolitan areas, it's going to look really different and it's going to mm -hmm. have to, to be successful. And I, I think globally is the same. So I... Yeah, I worry too, is that's something that funders need to take on too, is, is making sure like, hey, we've collected all these best practices or we've seen it across our portfolio, but I get it's going to be a little different for you. So how do you add into it? Is that, you know, is there a role for funders funding in that type of sort of knowledge share and experimentation? Oh, definitely. Um, and we would strongly argue as well, you know, there the role of technology and how do you capture your data definitely come in. Um, we did an interesting research last year with, Blackboard that was really looking at what kind of organizations did really well after COVID and which organizations did not do well. And some strong elements were around how agile can you be? How fast can you measure that certain new initiatives are, are working or not? You know, with COVID and suddenly everyone is at home, what do you do? Um, <laughs> right, right. Yeah, that was big. <laughs> 
Yes, um, are you continuing with face-to-face, -face, which is not allowed anymore, for example, or are you swapping back to telemarketing activities because actually having a conversation at the time with somebody else, then your family in your own home was quite pleasant. And what is your messaging there and how do you how do you build upon that? So what we noticed there is that as soon as technology was in place to capture data and really know very quickly this is working or this is not working or this is the feedback that we are getting and kind of measuring it really showed that organizations who had that technology in place and i would almost say with technology even have what i often call the fundraising basics in place do you measure what you're doing yeah they really they really showed that they were that they were uh, ahead of the curve of the ones that did not have their basics in place and their technology in place and another interesting part was so how did that really become that in one organization the technology was in place and others not and of course it has to do with investments but actually, the more important element there was leadership. Is leadership behind technology, innovation, trying, measuring, following up on it, or is leadership not behind it? And that was actually the crucial element. So even when an investment might be there, that does not necessarily mean that the decisions will be made of investing in it. And so, yeah, the leadership role is really crucial of getting that technology in place and once it in place also how do you allocate that data you know it's nice to capture data but do you use it and do you really adapt accordingly and i think the the covid period really showed that we had to continuously change and adapt and a lot of people would argue in the kind of perma crisis that we are in at the moment we still have to continuously adapt um yes and their technology is um interesting supporting role yeah i mean I, we definitely want to talk to with you just about the role technology plays in transformation within the sector the leadership role within it and it's interesting because from that perspective it's it's honest it's like it's not necessarily just about the technology tool i think that's what people miss in digital transformation it's a it's a new way of working and then leadership needs to to your point invest and in, you're saying you've said adaptation and we've all talked about that but for me there's also like there's always a gap in adoption you know mm. I, to your point we've made an investment i have this tool now i've but do i have did i put time and effort to train someone am i really yeah. in because you know the return on implementing a new tool is probably like three years and everybody yeah. everybody wants something in six months and then it doesn't work in six months and everybody yeah. gets upset about it but the, the money's been in and you know, it, it sounds like your report, though, that you did with BlackBot is proving out like, hey, leadership, th those that were ready and are willing to keep doing this, you are going to continue to be successful. Those that haven't, yeah. you're, you're getting left behind. And I had worried about that going into it. I, I wondered where, I don't think we're through it yet, but I've been wondering what the shakeout's really going to look like between groups that were able to adopt and adapt compared to others that haven't. And yeah, I don't know, it sounds like you've got proof in the pudding. Some, some groups are, are getting left behind. Yeah, and I think that's one of these hypotheses where we thought that might be true, but it is very nice when you get it confirmed as well, especially for fundraisers in organizations who really want to convince their leaders to start implementing technology. So I really felt the report showed some some proven data there and a stronger a stronger cause for support for, for many people and you know, organizations who want to make that change. Another interesting element there is, you know, we often talk about technology as the latest, newest thing there. And we are always curious, you know, on innovation and new tech trends, what that will be. Uh, at the same time, we really notice with this, with this, with this research that many organizations do not have their CRMs in place or do not have optimized their you know, the, the use of data uh, data allocation. And you could say, well, data can be optimized all the time, but really feeling confident about it. Are you really using your data in the right way? A big percentage and a big group actually said, mm, no, not yet. We are far from there. And I found it always fascinating when we're talking, for, for example, now around the role of AI, the role of chat GPT, and of course, it is really important for all of us to see how we can utilize it and what it can what it can do for us in the social impact sector. 
but it's also bringing the conversation back to yeah do we have our basics in place you know do we have an operating crm if we are working with individuals um, and creating an individual supporter base um, are we using the data in the right way that we really can optimize our journeys with our audiences and really build on that and also see if we start trying and innovating new things if it's working or not so there is i think technology wise also an yeah differentiation between the latest tech trends and just starting with the basics i'm following the same thing yeah in the ai conversation it's just getting so big right now and i feel the same way there's a lot of groups that the basics just aren't set yet and including just internally and in how leadership could run a process like do you have What's your innovation process like within your organization? What tolerance do you have for trying new things? And what's your budget like for that? And what freedoms are you giving staff to do something that might not work out? Because yeah. I, I think that's part of the truth. It doesn't always work out the way you think it's going to. Um, and I don't know very many organizations that have invested. I, I think they've heard digital transformation. And they think, I, I'm going to acquire a tool. And now I've transformed. <laughs> I've, yeah. I've I've acquired the CRM and you know that's to your point that's yeah. a really basic step but then how's as a leader how are you facilitating the ability to to do that and not demand an instant result within a certain period of time instead of saying just give me the just I have expectations and I was writing that down too a little bit what you're saying I think for the groups reading your report and they're trying to get groups the leadership on board with helping them get the technology in place it's like you need whether you can afford it or not, or the time or not, at least to set the expectation. Because you had talked about the, the groups that are talking about, make sure you say what the what was for the learning. And I'm always like, what did it take also? Like it took 15 people for a year and a half focused on this mm -hmm. thing. Like, so I know you want this thing leadership, but like we have two people, <laughs> we don't have a year and a half. So like, how do we reset expectations based off of level of effort it takes to also do this work in the technology and data space yeah i think that's that's really crucial and that comes back to leadership again you know yeah. um and of course it also comes back towards investment but it really starts with leadership yeah, is there the is there that drive to yeah to really implement it the right way and to really make the right investments not only financially but definitely also human resources it's the, it's it's the whole thing, and yeah, digital transformation is just not tech. It's all these other pieces, and but the sector needs it. I think to your point, I mean, if we're actually going to really be able to share these stories and create an open source knowledge framework that everybody can adapt and use, contribute to, I mean, it, technology is going to enable that, but the technology itself won't do it. An AI system just won't yeah. do it, and technology True. it moves. Technology moves at such a pace. That our organizations have to stop trying to stay on pace with it. They, they they've got to get the basics first and then go back. I remember a conversation I had with um head of an organization, and he was so enamored with wanting to be the Uber of the in the sector in the nonprofit space. And I was like, but you gotta understand, like being disruptive is disruptive. It's breaking <laughs> people's workflows, and you don't you don't have the capability to handle that with your staff. You're gonna throw a lot of people off. Right. And you're going to see people leave your organization, but you don't have a plan other than wanting to sort of make a mark. And so yeah. I, these like in, in the U.S., right, the whole Silicon Valley tech sexiness of trying something new. It, I don't think it translates very well into what we're trying to do to create stability and performance uh, for the long haul in the nonprofit space. So, yeah, that that tech pacing, I think everyone should slow down a little. I think I think as long as it's really leading towards that purpose, you know, what right. do we want to achieve in the end? And tech for tech, because it's fun, you know. Um, I've got a software background long time ago. Uh, I I love the the innovative elements of it, but I think we need to keep in mind what is it really what we want to achieve. And if technology can help there in different ways, you know, we are talking a lot about it from a fundraising perspective, but we all know that technology really can. Yeah, can create amazing new things. I mean, access to banks via mobile phones, uh, complete, complete change in the world, you know, uh, even the fact that mobile phones are available uh, almost everywhere on this planet at the moment and access to internet becomes so much more populated everywhere. That's really, it, it is a massive, massive game changer. So I'm definitely not against technology. I'm just really focused on is technology doing the right thing? 
and then within that, how is it accepted within your organization? So bringing it back to the organization, really, is it yeah, is it something just have to have, or is it having a purpose to achieve the bigger purpose that you're there for? I think for me, everything should be aligned around that. That's why we're operating the social impact sector. So yeah, yeah, that's what it should do. I, I'd get very enamored with technology and software development too. So I, 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 I do understand the draw and I, I played in that space for a long time too. Um, just uh, another quick question too. So most of the audience listening in here is going to be based over in the States. Um, and I've heard a lot, you know, and you're talking international fundraising group everywhere. I mean, what are some of the differences you, you see or that are happening outside of the U.S. in fundraising that we probably aren't paying attention to here that we might want to start thinking about? Yeah, I think if you're really looking at different fundraising elements, a lot of innovation is happening not anymore in the north, what I would call, but definitely in the so-called global global majority countries. It's because they started later, maybe sometimes. It's because they start with a limited budget. It's because new technology is available. So if, for example, we are talking about, about phones, I mean, the fact that you can make a payment in India on your phone for you know, a couple of cents uh, and it's accessible for everyone, that is opening suddenly the doors to 1.4 billion people. And I'm not saying all 1.4 people will have the capacity and capability of maybe to, to give a donation, but it's a tremendous big amount of people. Um, we've seen in Kenya, you know, the, the mobile uh, donations via M-Pesa. That's a complete different approach, which is absolutely beautiful. Uh, and are we building on that? Or, you know, do we want to translate something in that happens in a European country towards Kenya? Um, I think there's a lot to learn there. Uh, and sometimes they are really yeah, ahead of the curve because they missed a couple of the steps beforehand, you know, or because they suddenly now new things get introduced. Yeah, and they're really there and they really can build upon it and, and move faster. So a lot of innovation is happening in different different parts of the world. And I think the beauty is where in the past we really saw kind of a north-south um, translation and capacity building. Now it is going west, east, east, north. It's going in all the directions. And that's the beautiful part of where we are at the moment. Yeah, there is a, a tremendous amount of innovation, learnings, best practices happening everywhere. And I think there is a big desire to understand more about it and see how we can translate it into our own cultures, areas of work. Oh, I love it. And it sounds like, yeah, your conference and all the work y'all are doing sounds like it positions you really at a, a central point to pull a lot of that ideas together. And with the Unite theme, I, I was just thinking about as a lot of people have been starting to return to conferences. And one thing I felt, and I think other people do too, is, is the relationship you get where you're not alone in the social sector work either. I, it's easy, especially coming through COVID, to have felt very isolated and mm. It's very refreshing, I think, to be around other people that are trying to solve things like you're trying to solve, and they're working on the things you're working on, and you just get to talk to somebody about that for a little bit, uh, and that that camaraderie, I think, that you're helping to facilitate globally, I think, is urgently important to your point for the many amounts of crises we're all trying to work on at the same time. So thank you. Yes, no, no, I really appreciate it. I mean, it's beautiful to walk around with groups of people that come from over 80 countries and everyone is connecting with each other and sharing with each other. And yeah, you know, they really have that sense of being part of one big community. And it doesn't matter where you are. It doesn't matter how small or how big your organization is, but just simply the desire of learning and sharing learning from each other, sharing with each other, and see about how we can collaborate together to really create that impact. It's, yeah, I'm happy to be part of it. <laughs> That's incredible. Uh, and thank you for that. I mean, it is really amazing. We're going to link to a lot of things in the show notes here. I hope we'll get some attention mm -hmm. and maybe some folks showing up uh, to be part of that amazing community and at least get some of these reports downloaded. Uh, before we start winding into some of the final questions, so uh, just to somewhat broad but maybe pulling us back to the basics you know if someone could start an organization from scratch today you know what are some of the key things you think they would need to address as part of their plan to build a sustainable organization nice question <laughs> <laughs> i would definitely say um well and if it's an organization with a social impact purpose on it 
understand where your funding sources are coming from, check whether you have the investments to make it happen um, towards, you know, achieving the goals. And if you therefore need a new organization or you should align with an existing one. But I think in the end, if you really want to make it happen, it's all about the people. Um, I worked for a very long time with Oxfam and I've been involved in quite a lot of the startup of new affiliates. And in the end, it's absolutely about the people and the drive of people to make it happen. You can have all the investments in the world, but if you do not have the people with the drive and the passion to make it happen, you're going nowhere. Um, so that's really, yeah, that's really a crucial element. I'm sure the talent is available to push the mission forward and get the belief all aligned. Yeah. Thank you for that. We we often like to, because we do a lot of change management work, we try to say, you know, what would your organization be like if it didn't have any baggage? If you could, mm -hmm. if you could mm -hmm. just take your head out of the moment and just imagine you didn't have any of that stuff that you're dealing with yeah. that's built up over years, and what would you do going forward? That's why I love asking that question of folks. But uh, the kind of the burn the house strategy, burn the yeah. house and start rebuilding it, and how will it look like? Yeah. Yeah. How do how do we free our thinking from yeah to the every day that we sit in? It's tough. Yeah. It is really tough. Oh. Um, Thank you so much. This has been an awesome conversation. I was very excited for this. And for anyone who's a regular listener of the show, you do know I ask the same question of all of our guests to close every episode. And we have started a Spotify channel from all of these answers. And today, Velika, I'm going to ask, what is your go-to song when you need a boost and why? <laughs> this is such a tough question. It really <laughs> makes me laugh because I think the go-to the go-to song for me uh, can vary from minute by minute, day by day. But I would say it's the one that I went to this morning when I woke up, and that is John Coltrane with Love Supreme. Oh. Mm -hmm. Nice one. It is. I recommend just... it to everyone. <laughs> Got it on vinyl. Just listening to it the other day. There we go. You see. Few of, few of my favorite things on that. It's, uh, that was how my wife and I walked in after we got married to the big party. Cool. Uh, no, I didn't know that. So that's a really nice coincidence then. Yeah. Serendipity. Well, thank you yeah. so much. Um, we'll get, like I said, we're going to get a lot of links out of this. Um, and if there's anything else you want to add, I'll make sure it gets onto the show notes page. And we really appreciate your time today and good luck with everything that you're working on. Thanks very much for having me. And anyone uh, who would love to know more about Resource Alliance, feel free to reach out to me. There are not a lot of Willeke van Heins in this world, so you know where to find me. Yeah, Wonderful. appreciate it. Big awesome. thanks, Tony. Thank you. Okay, and we'll see you next time. And to the audience, uh, like I said, please leave us a review or send us some questions and share with a friend if you can. Uh, and we'd really appreciate it. And thanks, everybody. Till next time.